Good morning, everyone. My name is Kerry Craig, and I am your host this morning. It is Prosperity Indiana's pleasure to have you participate on today's webinar, Neighborhood Development Strategies in Communities of Color. We wish to thank today's sponsor, Fifth Third Bank. Before I turn it over to Jacob Brown of Fifth Third Bank, I'd like to uh, do some housekeeping items. The first one is that uh, please be aware all audio is muted. If you'd like to ask a question at the end of the webinar, there are two ways to do so. First, you can use the raised hand icon on your screen and I will call on you to ask your question, or you may type your question into the question and answer box, which is also located on your screen. We all know that technology can be trying these days, especially while working from home, so if you lose your connection, you may also reconnect using the link emailed to you. Finally, Prosperity Indiana members may access today's presentation and recording later this afternoon in our member portal. And now I wish to turn it over to Jacob Brown, who is the Vice President and Banking Relationships Manager of Fifth Third Bank for some opening remarks. Jacob? Morning. Thank you very much for allowing me to join yet again today. And I'm, I'm very thankful to uh, be able to partner with Prosperity Indiana to help deliver these valuable resources to our community. Now more than ever, Fifth Third Bank is proud to remind our communities that we have been standing by their side for over 160 years, and that doesn't stop now. Given these unprecedented times, we're communicating more than ever about the resources and information available to secure the financial stability of our clients, our communities, and our families. At Fifth Third, we too are working diligently, much like the rest of you, to remain calm and consistent while trying to manage our organization. Through clear communications and discernment of our current resources, we have mobilized every asset available to better serve our customers while remaining hyper-vigilant to the needs of our own employees. We will continue to be at the forefront of sharing our best practices and expertise throughout these unprecedented times, and we are grateful to Prosperity Indiana for gathering us all together to provide information and resources. We're excited to be a part of this webinar and hear the questions of our region and continue to grow our capacity to serve and advise in these months to come. So thank you again for allowing me to join you today. Thank you, Jacob, and thank you again to our partners at Fifth Third Bank for making today's webinar possible. For more than 30 years, Prosperity Indiana has mobilized members to create economic opportunities and improve social conditions, particularly for Hoosiers who are most disadvantaged. As a statewide cross-sector membership network of approximately 200 organizations and individuals, Prosperity Indiana's impact through members has strengthened communities and improved lives in rural, suburban, and urban areas in every county. It is our mission to build a better future for our communities by providing advocacy, leveraging resources, including providing training and consulting services, and engaging an empowered network of members to do this important work. Our members represent human services, the arts, legal aid, congregations, workforce development, real estate, health services, financial institutions, philanthropy, all levels of government, community action agencies, private and nonprofit affordable housing developers, local economic development organizations, and more. If you are not a current member, please go to prosperityindiana.org to learn more. And now, I'd like to welcome Ashley Weaver, Director of Engagement at the Indianapolis Neighborhood Resource Center. Ashley, a native of Gary, Indiana, moved to Indianapolis in 2003. She joined Indy's nonprofit sector in 2013, serving two terms as an AmeriCorps member in the VISTA and Public Allies programs. In November 2016, she joined the team at Indianapolis Neighborhood Resource Center as a Neighborhood Development Specialist and currently serves as Director of Engagement. She is passionate about asset-based community development, racial equity, resident-led initiatives, and youth engagement. Ashley holds an Associate's Degree in Human Services Management, a Bachelor's Degree with a Concertation in Social and Behavioral Sciences, and an Associate Certificate in Youth Work. 
She has facilitated trainings for AmeriCorps members, the Governor's Council for People with Disabilities, IUPUI, Near East Area Renewal, the Mandela Washington Fellowship, Prosperity Indiana, Purdue Extension, Voices Corporation, and numerous neighborhoods in Indianapolis. The Indianapolis Neighborhood Resource Center works with neighborhood associations and neighborhood-based organizations throughout Marion County to provide training, resources, and support for communities to grow their quality of life. So now I will turn it over to Ashley and welcome her for her presentation. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much, Carrie, um, for that introduction. Um, again, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Ashley Weaver. I'm the Director of Engagement with the Indianapolis Neighborhood Resource Center, or INRC for short. Uh, thank you so much to um, Prosperity Indiana for pulling us all together today for this webinar to discuss neighborhood development strategies in communities of color. So um, let me get everything set up here to show screen in just a moment. We will dive into our conversation today. And Carrie, if you could just confirm for me that I'm good, the screen shows neighborhood development strategies right now? Yes. Okay. And we're we're still good, right? Sorry, guys. Technology is fun. Yeah, that, I'm not. I'm. I'm not seeing it yet. Okay. I did see it, but then I. And are we go. good now? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so again, actually, thank you. actually, we're we're seeing uh, we're seeing the notes uh, page on, on this. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, we're not seeing not the, the whole. whole um, right. I, I guess I should have the display display charge. <laughs> display settings. Yeah. Okay. If you go up to display settings. Mm hmm and then duplicate slideshow, we, we should see it in full. There we go, perfect. So um, again, thank you all for being here. Sorry for those uh, technical difficulties. Um, we're living, definitely living in an age where we are making the best with what we have, right? And I just want to um, really take a moment to, again, thank Prosperity Indiana for um, for their work and for having having me here today to discuss these topics. And if some of you signed up previously, <clears throat> you may have noticed that the webinar was originally titled Neighborhood Development Strategies in Minority Communities. And I just wanted to um, speak for just a second about uh, the term minority. Um, quick discussion that since the 1990s, minority has been used to refer to four major racial and ethnic groups, African Americans, American Indians, um, and Alaska Natives, Asians and Pacific Islanders, and Hispanic and Latin populations. So although we know that the term has been used to identify oppressed groups and is common in census reports, um, surveys, and statistical data, there is also a negative connotation, uh, words like different and subordinate and non-white and um, even less than are associated with the word minority. So that's, that's a word that subconsciously or really overtly places non-white people in a category of being less than white people. So I would encourage that we step away from this term and 
start to embrace the term communities of color, which again, I'm very thankful to um, Prosperity Indiana for making that change to our, um, our webinar today. But I would even encourage and challenge you to use more specific language if you are working in neighborhoods that predominantly identify as Black or Latino or Chin, have enough respect to acknowledge our diverse communities of color based on terms that define and unite us. So um, I will get off of my soapbox so we can dig into three um, fundamental strategies that INRC employs when um, working in neighborhood development and um, working with resident leaders and grassroots organizations. And those fundamental strategies are asset-based community development, appreciative inquiry, and direct action organizing. Asset-based community development is truly the foundation of the work at INRC. Um, but when I first learned about it, this is what I envision. Um, view the glasses half full instead of half empty, uh, be an optimist, not a pessimist, but um, I now know that asset-based community development is so much more intentional than that. So if we break the term down just a bit and we think about the words asset-based and knowing that an asset is a useful or valuable person, place, or thing, and base means to have as the foundation for something. We can define asset base as a foundational belief that people, places, and things have value. So why is that important when you're working with neighborhoods? So let's try this. Um, I'd like you all to take just a moment to think about something that you view as a weakness or a negative quality. Now imagine, if every time you met someone, the person introducing you talked only about that trait. Imagine if every time people talked about you, they only talked about your worst quality. Now imagine if you were constantly being judged by your biggest mistake. That feels pretty bad, right? I'm sure I can wager to guess that um, <clears throat> you're not feeling very excited about showing up or trying to connect and engage with people because the only topic of conversation is the worst of you. Okay? So what happens when we identify and feed into people's strengths, when we discuss and uplift communities based on what they have instead of what they're lacking? How do you feel when you're recognized for your gifts, talents, or abilities? It's, um, it's a lot better, right? So ABCD challenges us to recognize the assets in ourselves, each other, and the communities, instead of stopping the conversation at just what's lacking. People and places are not just problems that need to be solved. And when we can see past the problems to the potential, we can collaborate to create the changes that we want to see. So let's go back to our definitions and reviewing quickly, asset based is a foundational belief that people, places, and things have value. And community development can be defined as collective action for change. So if we put all of that together, we can define asset-based community development as using what we have to create change, which is much more than just seeing the glass as half full. It is recognizing that even when we feel like the glass is half empty, we have to recognize that glass of water as an asset and recognize that we have we have to decide what we're going to do with it. We have the opportunity to make those choices, to identify what is working in our communities, who is doing the work, and how do we want to move forward.
So that leads us to appreciative inquiry, which is a strategy that focuses on the way that we engage with people. You have to talk to people, right? You have to connect with them. We have to normalize talking to the people that are living the experience that we hope to improve. Do you know what they care about? Do you know what would make them more safe and secure in their everyday lives? Are we even asking those questions, right? So appreciative inquiry um, follows a cycle called the 4D cycle, I'm making it easy to remember hopefully, um, and those, the parts of that cycle are discovery, dream, design, and destiny. So this, the discovery phase focuses on what is. This is where you want to learn more about the neighborhood, community, and the people that live there. We want to ask questions in this phase about the history of the neighborhood. We're trying to find out from folks, what do you enjoy about living in the community? Who are the people here that are doing work? Um, what are the assets that we should be identifying? So discovery really challenges us to take a look at what is. Um, and also recognizing that that might not always be pretty. Some of the things that come up in that discovery phase might be painful. There may be some distrust, um, there may be concerns, maybe problems, but the, dis the discovery phase helps us understand the communities and neighborhoods and people that we are hoping to work with. So in the dream phase, we move into thinking about the vision for the neighborhood. What could be? What do we want to see? What is the vision for the community? We're asking questions in this phase and encouraging engagement that um, takes people to a place where they're thinking about what would they like to see in their neighborhood? And that question about what, what would make you feel safe and secure? Um, what would encourage you? Um, what resources are needed? What, what might be? So we're trying to work on our vision, right? During that dream phase. And in the design phase, we start to think about what we should do to move in the direction of that vision. So we're finding out what people are passionate about, um, what should happen, what's our strategy, who's working together on which projects. In that design phase where we're really getting ready for the next step of action and moving into the vision that we've determined, those dreams that we've looked at. So in the destiny phase, we are moving toward the vision and creating the change that we want to see. Um, we're asking questions like, what will be the impact of this event or program or project? And maybe even stretching into questions like, what will we do next? Which if you notice, this is a cycle. So that takes us right back to the discovery phase and an appreciation of what is. Um, a celebration for of the success that happened in the creation phase under destiny. And now we're looking at things again, like, okay, where are we right now? Now what's the next step? And then that process continues. This is very important and appreciative inquiry that we are asking open-ended questions, not just yes or no. Um, and appreciative inquiry really challenges us to not put our own ideas into the questions that we're asking. So, uh, for example, if we're looking out into the crowd and we recognize that we don't have a lot of people at this particular meeting or event, um, it might be instinct to ask the question, well, um, do you think if we had food here, we would get more people here? And um, appreciative inquiry would challenge us to ask the question, um, what do you think would increase att attendance? So um, not leading our questions with 
kind of our own predetermined solution in mind, but really leaving that open to hear from the neighborhood, the residents, the um, people that we're working with on their thoughts. All right, so the third strategy that we want to review quickly today is uh, direct action organizing. Some of you may be familiar with this and know that this is actually a um, six part process, but uh, we're going to really focus in on the first three steps. So the first thing we do in direct action organizing is we identify the problems or concerns in the community. And you guys did in true asset-based fashion, I'm probably going to change those words around a little bit and say that we are identifying what we want to improve together. Um, again, communities are not just problems that need to be solved. People are not just problems that need to be solved, but we can recognize when there are areas of improvement and let's be honest, sometimes there are problems, right? Sometimes there are concerns. Um, and we want to be cognizant of that and but also view that in a way that it is not just the problem that we're thinking beyond that so if we're looking at something that we want to improve together as a neighborhood we um, list those we list those things out right and then we move towards brainstorming solutions to those problems, concerns. And this brainstorm pulls up a lot of different ways, I'm telling you, um, lots of different ways that we can tackle different problems or concerns or things that need to be improved. And those solutions then become the issue that we're organizing around. So we're, um, we're not trying to pull people together around the identified problem, we move to a space of thinking about what are the solutions to those problems, and we're organizing people around that. Then the final step is really strategy, which may include creating some committees to focus on specific initiatives, or um, teams that are honing in on specific um, specific solutions that have been identified and um, really rallying around what is now our issue. So let me give you an example of what direct action organizing might look like in real time. And so if we're in a neighborhood that one of the concerns or something that they want to improve is access to healthy foods. And, and we know um, in Indiana and in a lot of Marion County, we have food deserts. So this is a, a real concern for some of our neighbors and residents. So we want to improve access to healthy foods in our community. So there could be a number of ways that people think we could improve that. Anything from developing a community garden to um, inviting in a group or volunteers to teach a cooking class at a local community center or partnering with a farmer's market to uh, bring fresh produce and items right into the neighborhood. All of those are possible solutions. So they become our issue. Okay? That's the issue that we're organizing around. I then move to organizing people who want to help with a community garden, organizing people that want to help with or support a um, cooking class or attend a cooking class, um, and organizing people around bringing in farmers market to uh, sell fresh produce in the neighborhood. Our strategies include probably different teams of people that are using their own talents and passions and skills in one of those issues. 
um, to really lead us to the improvement that we're hoping to see, with that end goal being um, that we have addressed uh, lack of access to healthy food through this direct action organizing process. So we have discussed strategies, uh, three of the strategies that we employ, again, asset-based community development, appreciative inquiry, and direct action organizing. So let's move into the neighborhood development process. And what you'll see in this process is that a lot of this points back to these three strategies, or that these strategies kind of go hand in hand with the process. Now, uh, I can guarantee you there is no surefire way or um, no rule book that will tell you exactly how to um, how to um, use neighborhood development or work with neighbors in a community because all of our communities are different. Right? Everyone, everyone has um, skills and talents and gifts and every community has their own set of assets and people and places and things that should be uplifted and recognized. Um, so there's not a one size fits all for this process. And the biggest part of it is really being willing to listen and engage with, with, an, with the neighbors and with the neighborhood that you're hoping to work with. So let's start with first part of this process and um, a piece that will continue throughout this whole thing. It's honesty. Right? This work is relational. It is not transactional. Um, if you are working in a community, if your organization is working in a community, it's important that you are transparent about your intentions and your goals in that neighborhood. And at the same time that you are providing a space for the residents and those you hope to serve to be honest about their history in the community, um, what they've seen, um, what they liked, what they didn't. Um, we have to create spaces where we're building trust with our neighbors. Uh, this does not come easily, does not come quickly. Um, someone told me once that um, progress moves at the speed of trust, right? So um, this honesty piece is so important in the work that you're doing in neighborhoods. We were able to see some of this in action uh, while we were working with Near West, which is a collaborative of, of actually four neighborhoods on the Near West side of Indianapolis. Those neighborhoods are Hogville, Hawthorne, Stringtown, and We Care. And, and um, we received funding um, to work with these four neighborhoods collectively on some capacity building programming. There's a lot of great people doing great work and they were interested in having the opportunity to really work together and hone in on um, strategies and programming that could help them as a collective, right? And there, there were long time seasoned leaders in that group and also brand new people. And the conversations that came up were um, beneficial to building the relationships that would be necessary for them to continue to collaborate for both their individual neighborhoods and the collective. And um, I'm just showing here a little bit of data from um, Indie Vitals to give you a picture um, statistically with numbers, like the Near West community, but of course we know the numbers never really give us the full story about any neighborhood, but um, I am a data geek, so I figured I would share some of those details with you all today. So honesty. Honesty is first and it lasts throughout this whole process. We just have to, we have to be willing to create the spaces where people feel safe enough to be honest about where they are currently in their community and where they want to be. 
Um, the next thing that we that we work on is an asset mapping because we know that some neighborhoods are only seen from the perspective of their largest deficits. And that ties into asset based community development and as we're identifying assets in a community, we use five categories for that. First, it's people. People are the most important asset in any neighborhood and you need to take the time to identify who are the people doing the work in the community. Um, who are the people that want to be involved in the work in the neighborhood? Right? The next category is associations, and these are the folks that have already come together around um, particular issues or concerns or um, assets and initiatives that they're passionate about. The next is institutions, which is pretty much everything else in your neighborhood, schools, libraries, grocery stores, restaurants. Uh, gas stations, liquor stores, you name it, it's an institution. Um, and it's important to recognize that our institutions in our community are assets. And as we organize together around solutions, um, we're able to kind of hold our institutions accountable to how they're engaging and supporting the work. We can ask them even too, hey, what's your vision for this neighborhood? Okay. So land is both our um, parks and green spaces and water access, but also acknowledges the um, possibilities with um, blight, blighted communities or um, abandoned homes because there, there's a potential there. And I would almost argue that it's probably a topic for another conversation that gentrification happens because someone outside of the community sees the potential in land or homes that um, we don't always see when we're right there in it, right? So if we could start to view our communities and neighborhoods, even in their worst conditions, as um, a place for development and potential, what could we do? What could we do together? And, and then finally, exchange is the last, <clears throat> last category, and that's twofold, thinking about our locally owned businesses in a community and, um, how often a dollar can travel in our neighborhoods and supporting and acknowledging those locally owned businesses and thinking about events where we exchange information. So a great example of asset mapping at work is the Far East Side. We worked with the Far East Side on a series of community conversations with led, which led to the development of the Far East Side Community Council. Um, so those conversations were really focused in on not waiting for someone to come in with the answers, but recognizing that the Far East Side was full of people and places and things that had value and how to connect and collaborate in that way. Um, this group has done phenomenal work creating things like the first annual Far East Side Festival and um, remonstrating against development that they don't want in the community. So I'm um, really honing in on our assets and taking that time is um, it's a powerful tool and a powerful step in the neighborhood development process. So then we move to um, vision. So we started with honesty, we're asset mapping. Now we're talking about our vision. And I asked two questions in this. What is your vision? And what are you willing to do, give, or create to get there? Such a huge question in neighborhood development. And I guarantee you there's so many people in neighborhoods that you want to serve that no one's asking them those questions. What is your vision and what can you do to make it happen? Right? And um, this makes me think about the Arlington Woods area. Arlington Woods Neighborhood Association is, um, we are kind of in the in the mode of like revamping, revitalizing, and trying to just really um, stay together during the pandemic, um, which has uh, been a little bit difficult, but we still have neighbors that are engaging and connecting and um, that have a clear vision of what they want to see, that have identified um, key topics that are important to them, being uh, beautification, crime reduction, and youth engagement. So, they're, um, they're working together to create the vision that they've determined as a neighborhood that they want. And that also takes us 
into strategies, okay? which is our next, our next uh, step in the process. Because a goal without a plan is just a wish. Okay? So um, Arlington Woods has identified or given the members of the Neighborhood Association the opportunity to identify like where they want to put their time and talent. Right. Is it with Unification Committee? Is it with the Youth Engagement Committee? Is it with Crime Reduction? Like recognizing first taking that step to find out what is the vision and what do we care about? And then saying, OK, how do we dedicate our time to this and planning events like a um, cleanup at the end of this month? And how do we engage youth in that? Um, how do we work together with um, the district counselor on crime reduction? So creating strategies often means creating teams or committees or whatever term makes your neighborhood feel comfortable. But it's OK for a lot of us to um, to work on some different different pieces of the, the overarching goal. Okay? And then finally is action. So if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And what's so important in neighborhood development is really making sure we have that action piece. We all know, I'm sure I'm kind of preaching to the choir in this, what it feels like to be in meeting after meeting after meeting and feel like we're not getting anywhere, right? So um, action, sorry about that. Action is a, a key part of the neighborhood development process. What are we working towards? Um, what can we what can we point to and say, like, look, look what we've accomplished? And this action step includes the whole whole um, part of like the planning process too. Like we need to identify in the beginning, like what what does this look like when we've completed it, so that we know we're done, so that part of our action is celebrating our success too. Um, it's not enough to just talk about what we want to do. We have to be in a position to make it make it happen. Right. So um, that makes me think about a um, young group of youth that I'm currently working with in INRC's Youth Community Building Institute with um, Oasis Community Development Corporation in the Martin Del Brightwood area. Uh, this group of, group of youth identified some of their concerns in the community, and one of them was that they were being catcalled when they were walking in their neighborhoods, um, and they're afraid. Uh, they're afraid of being kidnapped. They're afraid of sex trafficking. And we're talking about a group of youth between the ages of like 13 and 16, right? Um, so we brainstorm some solutions, right? We're in our direct action organizing phase and we've identified a concern and we've talked about some solutions. And one of those solutions was self-defense class. So this young group of teens has um, worked together and created a free, uh, being paid for through a um, grant um, that INRC received uh, for community crime prevention grant. Um, with $500, they are creating a free um, self-defense class for 12 um, young women between the ages of 13 and 16 um, to teach them jujitsu so that they feel a little more confident in um, walking in their neighborhoods. So this, this action step was very important because we could discuss all day what we could do, but it's moving into action that really really makes a difference. That's what's really impactful. And that can keep your group together because there's something exciting and rejuvenating about being able to say, look what we did together. 
right? So they are um, actually embarking on this this adventure this week. So I'm super, super excited for them. Uh, real quick, just want to touch very quickly. It's amazing how fast an hour goes when you're um, talking the whole time. I just want to revisit and just touch on what we've talked about today, right? in neighborhood development and specifically thinking about our communities of color, right? The strategies that we use our asset-based community development, use what we have to create change. We don't have to wait for someone else to come in and save us. What do we have here? Right? An appreciative inquiry challenges us to ask questions and plan and discover more about each other, dream about what could be design that process, and then what does it look like in fruition, that destiny piece. And direct action organizing challenges us to, yes, there may be problems, concerns, things we need to improve, but don't stay there. How do we fix that? Um, and there could be a multitude of answers to that but that we're engaging and organizing people around the solution, not the problem. Sometimes problems feel too big to solve, but if we already have a few different points that we've identified as a possible solution, it's much easier to get people together around that, and including people in the process of determining what those solutions are. So those are our strategies and our process um, follows five steps. And that first one, honesty. And that will permeate the entire process that permeates your strategies. There has to be trust and space to be honest and to have these um, dialogues that lead to action. Uh, this work is relational. It is not transactional. Asset mapping challenges us to identify assets in our community. Who are the people associations, institutions, the land, the exchange, what is happening already in this neighborhood. Vision challenges us to think about what do we want to see? What is your vision for the community? And what can you do to help us get there? As an individual, or as a collaborative, or as an organization, what's your vision and what are you willing to give to get there? Strategy. Uh, tells us that we, you know, we got to figure out the plan. How do we do this? And sometimes that strategy is breaking us down into smaller teams that are focused in on pieces of this vision. So that we're, we might not all be moving on the exact same topic, but we're all moving to this collective vision that we've already determined in action. Action is a process that includes that pre-planning and um, planning and figuring out next steps and um, having time in there for um, celebration and, you know, acknowledging and lifting up our success. And then kind of takes us right back into, okay, so now what, right? Um, so yes, those are, our um, strategies and processes of neighborhood development. I would like to go ahead and open it up to any questions, comments, concerns. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. If uh, anyone has any questions, you're welcome to um, ask your question uh, in the question panel, and uh, I will read that out and uh, Ashley will respond, um, or you can ask your, raise your hand, and I will call upon you, and you can ask your question directly. Are there any questions for Ashley? I have a question, Ashley. When the INRC is called upon to um, facilitate uh, in um, neighborhoods, how do you engage the community to really take the leadership 
um, for both um, for the development process rather than leading it yourself um, as an organization. How do you in, engage um, individuals within the community to lead the process themselves? Yes, um, I think that um, kind of starts a lot of times with, um, again, honesty and transparency. I let neighborhoods know, like, I, I work by a model that I've done my job when they no longer need me, right? So from the beginning, um, we're kind of working together in um, with them knowing like hey I'm not here to I'm not here to lead there will be opportunities for you all to plug in and take on some leadership roles and I think that's a lot of that is um, really showing by example like what that looks like um, what it looks like to create an agenda, what it um, looks like to do that engagement piece, um, thinking about how to do outreach. So there's a lot of situations where neighbors in communities are, are not being asked to leave. And when presented with the opportunity to possibly be in a leadership role, and especially if they can work with other neighbors on that, like not taking it all on themselves. Um, folks want to be a part, folks uh, want to be a part of that decision making, and they want to feel like they're making a difference. So um, providing those opportunities and literally just asking them, how, how do you want to serve? How, what do you give to the community? Are you, you know, folks like, hey, I'm a mechanic. Um, hey, I'm a I'm a great gardener. Um, hey, I teach piano. It's like the kind of things that you find out about people when you're just willing to connect with them and um, let their talent show. So, yeah, we we try to make it very clear that we're our intention. INRC is not to lead; that we're there to um, give them the tools and the knowledge and everything that we have so that they are comfortable and ready to lead themselves. Great, thank you. Um, got some one comment here from Don uh, Bartimus is that uh, he really appreciates uh, this um, presentation and it was very helpful. He said it's our, uh, his hope that uh, their church can learn and grow in becoming uh, part of their community. Um, any uh, insights you could provide, Don, with how you know his institution, his church, can become more engaged within their community? Yes, I love that. Um, our faith-based institutions are so important in our neighborhoods, and you know that's the whole spectrum of our faith-based institutions, right? So, it is. One engagement strategy that we use that is not as <laughs> not as effective right now during COVID, but we try to identify third places. So what that basically means is that like people work one place or spend time one place, they they're at home, and then there's this one other place right that they're spending their time or um, frequenting often, and that you try to build relationships with these potential third places so that they'll let you put up a flyer or share information that you have coming up. Um, and for a lot of people, that third place is uh, their church or their place of worship, right? So um, I think there's extreme opportunity for our faith-based institutions to be a part of neighborhood development. Um, I'm speaking of Arlington Woods Neighborhood Association there in the catchment area of Eastern Star Church and Eastern Stars Rock Initiative was um, really kind of the starting conversation of how do we revitalize this neighborhood association that once existed. So our um, those institutions are assets to our community. So if there's anything that we need to talk more offline um, Don, please feel free. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're you're hitting it. It is important, and um, there are some 
some techniques and different things that you might be able to employ to really engage and connect with with the neighborhood and probably start with an asset map. What else? What is happening in your community right now? Who are the grassroots organizations? Who are the people doing the work? So I would start there. Great. Um, a question here from Maggie Sparts. She says, um, I'm a student of innovation. One key step innovators take is to test their ideas for strategic actions before they invest a lot of time and money. How do you do this with neighborhood action items? Mm, okay. The test and, the, and see, that's the, that's the tricky part about neighborhood development is you, there's not a lot of quick measures, right? Um, usually we're looking at something like revitali revitalization, which can take 10 to 15 years to really see the impact, or um, if we're even trying to prevent something, we're talking about like a three to five year impact. So I would say um, starting with that baseline of just figuring out maybe it's how people are feeling in the neighborhood. And it might be much more qualitative than quantitative in the beginning. Um, but as you continue the work, uh, you should be able to ask more questions that can point to some um, quantitative differences like reduction in crime rate or an increase in um, high school graduation or um, a decrease in the unemployment rate. So um, it might start off very or somewhat anecdotal, but um, if, you keep, if you keep moving, keep moving the needle, you should get to the point where you can have some of that uh, clear cut, statistically significant data. <laughs> Great. Um, David Hurley, um, ask this question, when reviewing institutional assets such as businesses, how do you deal with exploitive businesses um, that are often in poor communities, such as check cashing stores, liquor stores, those sorts of things? Yes, yes. So that's, that's when I really, really push the power of organizing because um, one person against a business or institution may feel like they can't get very far. But if we have organized a group of folks around um, maybe the solution is, let's just go with decreasing the unemployment rate. And we can point to institutions in our neighborhoods that are not employing the people in the neighborhood. And we have the power as an organized group to hold them accountable to that. And that's truly the power of organizing. It, it is a tool that has been around for decades, right? Probably even centuries, maybe it has another name. Um, but organizing makes change happen. So when we can pull people together and say, hey, this, this group of folks that are right here in your backyard are really going to hold you accountable to what you're doing, what you're saying how you're adding to the vision that we have for this community. Um, don't be afraid to invite them to the table. If, that, if the neighborhood is meeting and you have a problematic institution, hold them accountable to that. Um, where I identify, you know, think about institutions as assets. I've um, actually been a part of some undoing racism work and institutions can also be viewed as uh, the feet of oppression. Okay. So um, organizing, bringing multiple people together around the issue, or again, that issue is the solution to the problem. Organizing people around that helps us hold these institutions accountable. Sherry Early Aiden asks, um, is there a more in-depth training on asset-based community development? Yes, um, INRC offers a um, 
much more in-depth training on ABCD. We actually have like an ABCD 2.0 now too. We offer classes in the spring and the fall workshops. Those fall workshops are um, coming up. We don't have those dates down yet. I do apologize, but um, if you go to inrc.org, you'll be able to um, register for those classes. We are still doing our work virtually and remotely. So um, anyone, anyone in the state, wherever you are, if you would uh, like to participate in those classes, please visit inrc.org or feel free to reach out to me via email. I make sure you um, you get that information. But yes, we uh, we offer two two different levels, kind of an intro to ABCD and then an ABCD 2.0. Um, I don't know if you can answer this one, but um, I'll, I'll rephrase it in another question. This comes from Sheila Curry Campbell, and she's wanting to know more about funding in the Fort Wayne area. But I guess the question would be, where do neighborhood groups, associations um, in Indianapolis, where do they go um, for funding um, to um, to not only you know, start the process of developing um, a plan, um, but also um, uh, sustaining uh, those actions uh, long term. Yes, yes, um, funding, yes. Um, and you're right, I don't know enough about Fort Wayne funding opportunities, but mm -hmm. what I can say is if we're thinking about neighborhood development and thinking about that resident-led grassroots initiatives, um, it's important that there's some collaboration there. And that's why the asset map is so important. Like, and maybe you can identify some nonprofits, um, some grassroots orgs that are 501c3 that the neighborhood could potentially partner with. Um, giving them the necessary fiscal agent to apply for and um, and receive funding right so those asset maps again are so important like thinking about who can you partner with and we also know that there's some neighborhood organizations that are 501c3 so i still encourage partnership but um, that might be a little easier for those neighborhoods to bring in some of the funding that they might need but i would definitely definitely encourage you know partnering with the um, organizations that are in your community um, also inrc um, has the indianapolis community building institute which is a um, training program for neighborhoods that goes through all of these topics and much much more and um, at the end of the program upon graduation, there is a small grant available for the neighborhoods to um, complete a project or program in their community. Great. I, I, I know, for example, here in the Indianapolis area, you had talked about the Martindale Brightwood neighborhood. And of course, they do have a 501c3 that um, they utilize the Edna Martin Christian Center and, and they have applied for funding from the Lilly Endowment, for example, and I think other um, somewhat major national um, um, funders. And um, I know, for example, that, you know, neighborhoods might start by um, approaching their local community foundations. Um, and I, I know then, you know, perhaps um, there's the Follinger Foundation there in um, Fort Wayne as well. Um, so, you know, I know there, there are perhaps um, um, potential philanthropic resources um, there that can help um, launch these kinds of initiatives. Right. Any further questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ashley. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I think right now we're, we're seeing that some of the um, some of the disparities that exist in our communities are just being magnified by COVID. And a lot of our foundations, like you mentioned, CICF, like we're, we're seeing our um, key funders really thinking about well, what is happening at the grassroots level, what is happening directly in the neighborhoods, how do we support these resident-led initiatives? And it is very refreshing to see 
that um, our funders are really, really trying to support um, those na neighborhood development that's happening, you know, with with the neighbors. Mm -hmm. Well, does anyone have any further questions for Ashley? These have all been good questions. If not, on behalf of Prosperity Indiana, I want to thank each of you for participating uh, in today's webinar, Neighborhood Development Strategies and Communities of Color. Um, please look for an email from me later this afternoon inviting you to take a brief survey. Your feedback is important as we use this information to enhance the quality of our webinars and training. Also, please check out our website, www.prosperityindiana.org to view upcoming events and training in August. Next Monday, August the 17th, we will host a webinar partnering with community development corporations and community housing development organizations. The webinar begins at 10 a.m. Eastern Time and registration is open on our website. Before we close, I'd like to thank today's sponsors, our sponsor, Fifth Third Bank, for their support in helping us to host these informative webinars. I also wish to thank our presenter, Ashley Weaver, for her incredible insights. Again, we appreciate your participation. This now concludes our webinar. Thank you and have a great week to everyone. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you all. Great week.